Nice to see both of you. <laughs> Good to see you, Dennis. You know, I think it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that there probably are not two people in the country who have done more for the country's security and safeguarding it than the two of you. No. And Thank you. No, having, to know, having known both of you, having worked quite closely with you, George, um, what I know about each of you is there's a selfless quality uh, that has guided you in a deep sense of mission uh, that has really, really led you, I think, your whole lives. Mike Morell said uh, in the video that you really saved us from a second catastrophic event. Do you worry that there could be another one coming? Me first? You know, yeah. Oh. I'm just going to follow you anyway. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Not, not as much as I used to, yeah. all right? Um, what, what they want to do is the slow-moving, multiple-actor, multiple-strand attack complex against an iconic target with mass casualties. Uh -huh. And we've, we've gotten really good at this. And so the odds of that happening, I think, are, are really quite low. And that's a measure of success. And unfortunately, Dennis, what we're going to get the band of danger that we're in is what happened a little more than a year ago, just south of here, uh, along West Side Drive, with a lone actor, uh, a rental truck, just driving up the bicycle path, killed eight people. That's a tragedy, yep. but not a catastrophe. And so that, that describes, I think, the limits of our enemy's ability to do us harm right now in that range. The other thing I'd add is that uh, there's another sense of limit there, too. I don't think there's much more that George or I would recommend to you. If you could just let us do this, we could probably make sure that didn't happen. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have that idea. And we both have pretty strong security credentials uh, doing things that have been controversial. But I got no better idea. So we're much better off. I don't think that kind of attack takes place, but that constant danger in that kind of layer I just described, that's going to be there for a long time. Um, the only thing I would add, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Mike. I think the country's safer immeasurably yeah. by lots of things that occurred, including there was really in our time there was never a domestic side of vigilance. Yeah. We didn't. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have, we didn't deal with our borders, with our visas. There was no Directorate of Homeland Security. Actually, one of the big gaping holes we had at, prior to 9-11 is we were operating overseas, but you could get into the country with impunity, operate with impunity, uh, laws, policies, all of those things had to be changed. The only thing I would say is the one, uh, one thing I used to go, go to bed at night and worry about was Al-Qaeda's ability to get a biological, chemical, or nuclear weapon. Yeah. Iman Zawahiri has never been captured. He was the father of that program. Right. And the only thing I would say to the American people and to our policymakers is while we're dealing with all the other issues, the terrorism issue requires constant vigilance and care. Americans too often, the farther we get away from it, it lapses off into the sunset. And that vigilance, particularly with our foreign partners, the coalition of the willing that helped us, yeah. helped NSA, helped CIA, those relationships have to be nurtured, fostered, developed, and kept. And it really makes a fundamental difference. So the leadership there is really essential, not just the intelligence leadership, but the political leadership. So let me follow up with that. Uh, are you confident that the kind of collaborative approaches that the two of you engaged in <laughs> is still being uh, pursued. So uh, we're among family and friends here, right? So we can. Yeah, but, uh, but, 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 we're, but we're not. Off, but we're not off the record. <laughs> hey, I got my pension. <laughs> <laughs> and so Me far, too, Mike. So far Let's my go. clearance. All right, but we'll see. I, I want to say that the, actually the Las Vegas rules apply here. So whatever you say here is going to. Oh yeah, okay? I, I, I know. So. So to answer your question specifically, yes, mm -hmm. all right? And, and the reason that is yes. is because there isn't an intelligence relationship we have in which our partner is not the greater benefactor, all right? Now, that doesn't mean they're not important 
We don't love them, all right? But just because we're, we're big, powerful, global, rich, technologically superior, the flow of information is more powerfully this way than that. But we keep the deal because there's things coming this way that are just not otherwise available. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I will add one additional thought. Um, if I were advising Gina, all right, hey, Gina Haspel, the, the new director, okay. whom we both know and yeah. we're very supportive of her, it's the right choice. I wouldn't announce this to the workforce, but I'd get a small group of people I trusted and said, you know, a lot of it, what it is we do now, we depend on liaison to help us. And that's our, our phrase for the foreign teammates. I want you to go away and think thoughts and come back and tell me your thoughts as to how we would do this if we didn't have as much as deep a relationship with liaison as we now have. And that's my fear for America first, America alone. Yeah. If it goes too long, you, it, will, it will erode you, these relationships. You, you can't do it alone is what the answer is going to come yeah. back. And the erosion while. So what people don't understand is, is this coalition of yeah. intelligence services around the world. You understand the Secretary of State had the diplomatic mission. Mike and I had the mission of keeping that glue together. Yeah. Now there's this, we can hold it together. And, and because we, we, know, we know our counterparts, we trust them, but inevitably we don't function in a vacuum. Um, there's political cover you have yeah. to have, and you, we can keep it together, but the point is if you don't keep it together. So we, and, and, it, and it's, I don't care what issue you're talking about, yeah. uh, whether you're talking about what you're going to do about the Iranians or what you're going to do about trade or what you're going to do about terrorism, in the absence of that coalition being on side particularly in terrorism, going it alone is not an option. George, I, I, I watched George do this, but I, I actually benefited from it too at NSA, in the run-up to the war with Iraq. Yeah. I mean, the Germans kept the gates open in yeah. terms of intelligence cooperation with us. I mean, tactically, operationally significant intelligence, right. even though at the political level, the Germans were totally opposed to, to the second Gulf War. Yeah. So th this has got a lot of, it's got a lot of space, but it's not infinite. But what you're both saying is there's a, there's a kind of shelf life. Yeah, right. Without the, without the kind of political, not just cover, but real cooperation that creates a deeper incentive, a deeper investment, doing this, that is something you fear could, could fray over yeah. time. Yeah. All right, so that's, George, you said earlier that you know, what kept you up at night before was you know, if Al Qaeda or others got weapons of mass destruction. Does that still keep you up at night, or are there other things that keep you up at night? Uh, I mean, not, not sports that you, I mean, you know. Yeah, well, I, I actually, I mean, I actually get a pretty good night's sleep these days, <laughs> Dennis. Uh, no, I, that issue, uh, I, I will be candid and tell you that issue still bothers me. Yeah. Because it, there were unresolved issues in my mind. Yep. And, um, and it principally came from what the Pakistani nuclear scientists tried to do with Al-Qaeda that we stopped. Uh, illicit sources of uranium that we stopped. It happens in the world every day. The scientific knowledge is rampant. And we had a, we had a whole effort that you probably inherited called Loose Threads. What did we see that we never ran down? And I guess in the back of my mind, I still wonder about yeah. What loose threads are out there? Because if you think about what a, what a group like uh, the, the multiple spectacular hurt you, hurt you, commensurate with your standing as a superpower, was their modus operandi, not ISIS's. ISIS took it to another level and they localized it and they terrorized psychologically through lower scale attacks. But it's an issue you cannot, you, you, you know, you just can't get away because of the profound implications it would have. So, so one of the things you, you asked, so 9-11, but what about now? Yep. Um, one of the differences between then and now is that we got to play offense. Yep. And, and the video right. showed what the CIA did under George and, and going in to Afghanistan. That's a big deal. And, and, and you, you need to play offense. You, you can't win this no. CBW no. 
nuclear question just staying in the bunker. You've, you've, got, to, you've got to lean forward. So in July of 08, uh, one of the first targets after we convinced President Bush he needed to really ramp up the targeted killing program, the, the, the very first target after the, the decision to go ahead and be more active here was the head of the chemical program uh -huh. for al-Qaeda. Uh -huh. I don't mean this to be a political question. But it, but it is. Well, it, a lot depends upon how you interpret it. Look, the two of you spent a career speaking truth to power. I mean, we know uh, that issues get debated. You can have different points of view. Uh, but there has to be at least some ground truth. There has to be some facts that you operate on. Mm -hmm. We're now living in a world where we have, quote, fake news. Some would call it alternative facts. How does that affect the way business is being done in the intelligence community right now? So um, one, the answer is uh, because we're not in it, <laughs> we're not seeing it every day. Yeah. But ingrained deeply in the culture of, intel of intelligence analysts is to basically do this straight up and down, and nobody intervenes in the quality of our analysis. Now, any policymaker, you can have a view. Policymakers are smart people. They have their, own, they have friends. They have sources. We basically try and take, and, and, it, and it's not often evidentiary based and factual as much as it is the judgment of very smart people who've been following issues for a long time. And our responsibility and the culture is immunized from anybody trying to stifle the ability to tell you the truth as we see it. So. You can ignore us. Mm -hmm. You can make up other stories. You can go out there and tell people things. But don't think that we're going to stand up and defend you if you do. Because you can play without a safety net. But the culture of NSA, CIA, the entire intelligence community is basically, we're going to try and give you the right answer. You can make policy decisions that basically don't comport with the answer we've given you. Once you've made your policy decision, we will then acquire new data to help you understand right whether it's working or not. Mm -hmm. But there is, you know, Dick Helms, who's, I think, the legendary director of Central Intelligence, right. basically said three things. Keep it straight, stay out of the politics, dare to take risks, dare to get risks to tell them the truth. But it's really over to them to kind of interpret what we're telling them. Because there is a bright red line. Yeah. We don't make policy. Right. But our people, actually, if Mike tried to do it, or I tried to do it, you'd have a rebellion in the analytic ranks. <laughs> you, would ne you would never get away with skewing the product. I mean, the good news about that is you're saying there is a culture that is embedded in oh, the yeah. intelligence community. Yeah, I, I used to describe the two big operational directorates in CIA are what at one point were called the DO and the DI, the Directorate of Operations and the Directorate of Intelligence. And they have very different cultures. And I used to say the DO reminded me of Air Force fighter pilots, exactly. all right? And, and the DI reminded me of tenured college faculty. Exactly, right? And, exactly right. Yeah. They, di they didn't believe they worked for us. Yeah, right. So let me come back to what, what George just said yeah. about this interface between intelligence and policy. The, the formula I've always used is, I, I rarely went in there with a syllogism where I went, hey, Mr. President, whereas, whereas, and he goes, well, hell, Mike, therefore, I mean, generally, a good day for us was to create the left and the right-hand boundaries of legitimate policy debate. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of room in, to maneuver for the policymakers, although in an ideal world, we do set the left and right-hand limits of acceptable policy. And Dennis, one other thing I'd, I'd offer, this is echoing what George said, but I actually wrote about this and I talked to a bunch of PDB briefers, all right? And so we're talking about, you know, you said you weren't going to be political, but we're talking about the current president and, and how, do, how does this work? And one, one former PDB briefer said to me, he said, Mike, he said, look, we've, we've had presidents who've argued with us and we both work for President Bush. True. All right. Oh, he argued with us over what constituted objective reality. Mm -hmm. okay? But that, that's okay. That comes with the, with the turf. That comes with the turf. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
We've had presidents who have ignored our objective reality and represented something different, as you suggested. And the name that comes to mind is, is President Nixon. Okay. That is not what is happening now. And this PDB briefer says to me, remember that, remember that speech the president gave to the Boy Scouts about a year ago? Remember at the National Jamboree? A little, little over the top maybe for 12-year-olds, I think was the national consensus. And, and the president comes back a day or two later and says, no, 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 because there's a lot of outcry about it. No, no, it's not true. The, the Boy Scouts, the leadership, the leadership of the Boy Scouts called me. They told me it was the greatest speech ever given at the Jamboree. So the PDB briefer says, now, Mike, you know that didn't happen, right? I go, yeah. And then he says, does he? No, no, which is, which is different from arguing and is different than from lying. And, and the line I use is, to an uncomfortable degree, the departure point for what the administration says or does is not objective reality. And we're in the business of delivering objective reality. And so it, it represents a great challenge to the folks we left behind that they keep coming in and trying to create those left and right hand boundaries for an administration that seems to address these things in ways that are quite different than what we've seen in the past. That opens up a lot of different questions, which I'm, <laughs> which I'm actually not going to pursue. <laughs> Although I might to go for the easy ones, the North say, Koreans. I, I might uh, need <laughs> stitches in my tongue because I'm biting it right now. But. <laughs> You've never been shy before. <laughs> never. I was always shy around you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so let me switch to an easy one, Russia. Yeah. But I, but I, I want to ask it uh, in the following sense. Um, how seriously do you take what Russia is doing, not only in terms of having tried to intervene in our election, but in other elections? How serious is this, is this a threat to all the Western democracies? It's, it's a very big threat to all of Western democracies, and the origin, of the, the origin of the threat is his sense of weakness, ultimately, because he's trying to resuscitate the image yep. of the former Soviet Union as a great power. Mm -hmm. And what he did to us, and particularly what he did to us, he came into our front, he walked into our front door. He didn't do it clandestinely. No. He did it right up front. In, what he wanted was implausible deniability. Right, right. and so he showed up, but, 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 so but, he essentially, wanted but essentially the only thing he's got going for him is the only industry that works really is the energy industry. Right. And essentially, if you look at Syria, if you look at the Crimea, if you look at what he's done in the Ukraine, if you look at what he's done in this, in, in, against our electoral process in West European democracies, and particularly in the Middle East, Putin has now established himself through the use of power and strength as a formidable obstacle to anything that's going to happen in the region. Right. Um, so if you aren't prepared to have very tough discussions with Vladimir Putin about giving the choice to the right. Russians of, yeah. I can either give you path A or I can give you path B. Trust me, path B is not the path you want to go on, but if you can't, I mean, it, at we, this, these conversations have to, have, to, have to occur at the presidential level, at every other level of government, as you know, and we have to have a plan to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he's going to take what he can get. He's going to push us around. He's going to surprise us because he'll do asymmetric things. But what this, the Russians have always been great at active measures. Mm -hmm. However, what technology and the internet and social media have allowed them to do uh, on a massive scale is influence how people think. And here's the key point. Why were they so effective in the United States? They were so effective in the United States because we are so polarized and divided that they could play on that polarization and division and they understood how deeply divided. Now, if you're Putin and you're sitting back and you're watching the aftermath, you could never have dreamed this would have worked as well as it did. <laughs> Look at the chaos and the division and the polarization we give him every day to sort of continue his effort. So a little bit, is, a little bit of this is on us. Yeah. A, little bit is, a little bit of this is on how we 
how we talk about him and the fissures that we've created in our own societies, but he's totally maximized it and took advantage of it. Yeah, I disagree slightly. Most of this is on us, okay? Not a little bit. Look, if, if, if he and I were doing this, we would call it covert influence, all right? And I don't think George or I would ever deny we haven't dabbled in covert influence. But there's an iron law of physics. Covert influence never creates a fracture in a society. It only succeeds when it, it, when it identifies a fracture and then exploits the pre-existing fracture. Right. It's that's not what, rocket that's, science that's, that's what I meant, yeah. on the part, a part of him, all right? This is, we, we're, we're, look, he tries this stuff against Norway. It doesn't work be, because the Norwegians don't have the inherent divisions we now have in our society. Right. Let me reinforce the other point George made. This is a strategy of weakness. All right, we're, we're sitting here in Manhattan. This state has a larger economy than the Russian Federation. Okay, so does Texas and so does California, individually. Okay? I was on Morning Joe uh, three or four years ago and uh, he'd done something, we were complaining, and we're about ready to break for commercial. I'm down in DC and Scarborough's up here and I go, hey Joe, before you break, can I say one more thing? He goes, yeah, General, what do you got? I said, Joe, you realize he's doing this, and he's got nothing more than a pair of sevens in his hand. But until you call, sevens win. Interesting enough, George, you basically talked about having a, a private, blunt conversation with him mm -hmm. and having it parallel down the line, which mm -hmm. he's the key actor. I know that there's a, a couple years ago he was being interviewed by a journalist, and the journalist asked him, who are your main foreign policy advisors? And he thought about it for a minute, and he said, Helmut Schmidt and Henry Kissinger. And the journalist said, no, 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 I mean, who, in, you know, in your circle, I mean, who, who, are the main, who are your main foreign policy advisors who sort of give you information and, and, and how to approach things? He thought, thought for about a minute again, and he said, Helmut Schmidt and, Hel Helmut Schmidt and Henry Kissinger. Now, the moral of the story is the people around him in the foreign policy and national security area are largely functionaries. So the blunt conversation has to be with him. But you hinted at something when you said, but there has to be a plan for follow-up. You're not going to bluff this guy. You just said he's doing this all with a pair of seven. Mm -hmm. But if we simply have tough words in private to him and it's not matched by anything, he's going to think that we don't even have a pair. So without putting you too much on the spot, what's the kind of plan that has to reinforce the words? What kind of actions have to reinforce the words? So, um, I'm gonna be a little careful, but not. So let's, let's, just, let's just look at this enormous dependency that all of Europe has, and Eastern Europe in particular, has on Russian national, natural gas. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, kind of walk in and look at Vladimir and say, I'm gonna break this to you. Um, I got more natural gas in the United States than the rest of the world, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna write a check for a billion bucks or whatever it takes, and I'm gonna create liquefied natural gas facilities in every country I can in Eastern Europe, and I'm gonna, to, to the Germans and everybody else, and in five years, I'm gonna bankrupt your country. Watch this space. Yeah. Have a nice day. <laughs> So, George, I personally nominate you to go see him. I, no, I mean, no, no, that's I mean, exactly right. I mean, no, I'm, the, the, I'm look, serious. When, when, when Putin won was in control, this yeah. is prima Vedjev, I mean, the, the social, social contract was, hey, I'm going to be autocratic, but don't worry, we're all going to be rich because they were selling oil at 140, right? right? He comes back in power, it's, it's at 40. So now the new social contract is, I'm uh, still going to be autocratic, but don't worry, we're all gonna, you're, you're gonna be proud. And so he, he's doing all these things to redress historic Russian grievances. But, but that economic vulnerability is, is still the leverage. And we, I mean, it, it would have been dramatic for an American president to simply have said, we are going to become the world's greatest exporters of LNG. And we, we are gonna subsidize it, we're gonna use um, um, the American tax dollar to create facilities along the St. Lawrence 
where we load it up and send it to Hamburg and send it to, to other places in the in the book. I mean, you can you can call him after you can call him after he invaded the Ukraine and give him a lesson on international law for 45 minutes and he ain't going to listen to it. Um, but yeah. you can you can yeah, you yeah. can make his life miserable there too. But the point is, you know, Vladimir is really is really I'm really sorry this has happened. But um, well, by the way, there's part B, part C. But that's how the conversation. Look, he's a bully. There you can a, only talk to a bully one way. There was another debate in the Obama administration. Uh, you know, how much aid should we give to the Ukrainians after the, not, not just Crimea, but the invasion of the Donbass? And, and, and the limit, uh, the, the, the Obama administration really self-limited here in terms of what it was they would give the Ukrainians. On, on the theory, Dennis, and you would appreciate the theory, that the, that the Russians had escalation dominance. And therefore, no matter what we gave to the Ukrainians, the Russians could always match it or exceed it. But that ignored the, 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 the whole reality that he could not sustain, Lawsuit. stand, substantial Russian casualties. I mean, they have criminalized yeah. the announcement of Russian deaths in the Ukraine. And so you know, it's a hard policy, yeah. tougher than LNG, yeah. But, but, but frankly, that's what was required. They had escalation dominance in the early 80s in Afghanistan, too, until they didn't. Right. I mean, the irony is that what you're describing is we self-deterred. Yeah. And unfortunately, Putin read that pretty well. Look, we have a lot of partners in the Middle East uh, that we share intelligence with. Um, have you seen among these different partners uh, a growth in capability, one that actually contributes a fair amount to us in terms of our understanding, know-how? Or is it, <laughs> is it a steady state? So it's, not that, it's not that Mike and I don't like to talk, but we're now, <laughs> we're now at a sort of a, we'd love to tell you, Dennis, but then we'd have to kill you. You know, the irony is that for the sake of the Washington Institute, I'd be prepared to make that sacrifice. All right. So here, so here it goes. <laughs> so the, the Saudis under Mohammed bin Nayef, as the Minister of the Interior and the head of Saudi Mabayath, they were solid. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, MBN, Mohammed bin Nayef, was good enough that he became, for a short period of time, the Crown Prince. And then one of the complexities of today's complicated world is he's ousted as crown prince by Mohammed bin Salman, and he's been under house arrest ever since. Great partner. Wonderful partner for us. Thoroughly Arab, thoroughly Islamic, thoroughly cosmopolitan, thoroughly professional. Yeah, I got one. Oh. Jordanians. Yeah, oh, oh, easily, you bet. Top of the heap. Yep. The intimacy of the relationship with the Israelis, Mike, you know, I took it to one level and Mike yep. took it to a whole other level. Um, Are you surprised by the level of cooperation that now exists between the Israelis and most of the Sunni Arab states? It may be covert, but it's... No. No, I mean, I, I could see it. You know, I'm out of government 10 years now. I, I could see this convergence in terms of strategic interests bet between the Israelis and the Sunni Arab world as, as the... And I realize it's still important, but right. as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict began to reduce in terms of its centrality and, and, the, and the major fault line in the Middle East then became Sunni Shia. It, it was almost natural. I'll tell you how natural I thought it was. And this, this would have been last year as director and then my first couple of years outside of government. I was so convinced of this Israeli-Sunni convergence that I would not have been surprised. So there was a grand debate about the Iranian nuclear program and what we're going to do about it and so on. And, and frankly, my judgment was it was just a bridge too far for the IDF. The targets were too numerous. They were too dispersed. They were too hardened. They were too secret. And most importantly, they were too far. And so a small air force would have had to have dedicated so many of its fighters to buddy refueling. It's operational, tactical stuff. But it means they weren't carrying bombs. They were carrying fuel in order to enable some much smaller number of aircraft to get there, all right? That, that was the limiting operational factor on Israel's being able to 
to do anything here. I was so convinced of Sunni-Israeli convergence that I would not have been surprised that Israeli aircraft would have landed in Saudi Arabia on the return from the strike on Iran, quickly refueled at a hastily remade refueling point and flown back to Israel. And when that became semi-public, the Saudis would have simply said, wow, that's interesting. We'll have to look into it. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you an interesting story just to show the evolution. Uh, in the run-up to the, to the first Gulf War, uh, I was with Secretary Baker when we were asking the Saudis uh, to commit to us that if Saddam Hussein attacked Israel, they would stay in the coalition, they wouldn't do anything. And they said, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And then, of course, the second night of the war, when the Israelis were hit by scuds, the Israelis came to us and said, we'd like to overfly Saudi Arabia <laughs> to go hit Iraq. And the Saudis said, whoa, no way. Uh, I think it's a different world. Yeah. Uh, their, their priorities are different than they were then, yeah. uh, and uh, it, ref it represents a new strategic reality for us. And there's a lot, I do think it's also, it's an asset for us in terms of trying to counter the Iranians as they use Shia militia proxies. Let me ask a question. I mean, I, one of the things that obviously affects every administration is the context that they inherit. Mm -hmm. uh, President Obama approached Syria mainly because uh, of his perception of the experience in Iraq. Every time he looked at Syria, he saw Iraq. Uh, it didn't matter that, in fact, it was a very different circumstance, but he was convinced we would get sucked into a conflict that was complicated, sectarian, very costly, uh, and basically his, he pursued a policy of avoidance. Uh, do you think that, uh, I'll, I'll put it this way, how much do you think that this administration is affected by the experience in Iraq in terms of how it approaches Iran? And I want to I want to qualify it or maybe refine it by saying the administration's approach towards Iran is very tough rhetorically and it's tough in terms of sanctions and it'll be pulled out of the JCPOA. Uh, but do you see them as a try to counter malign, and I'm using their words, malign Iranian activities throughout the region, do you see them being influenced by the experience in Iraq or not? It's, it's, it's hard for me to judge whether they've been influenced. I think the concern I have here, um, I think the region has now entered a very dangerous period. Um, if you take a look at what the, so just for a moment on JCPOA, right? So the, Two positive things are we push that we push their acquisition of a nuclear weapon up eight years, and let's just say for a minute that we know we have to do something about the sunset clause. And at the time that it was signed, right, um, we averted a near-term war. Let's just also stipulate there's nobody in the intelligence community that believes that the Iranians are not in compliance with the agreement. Now, part two, the bad part: what the Iranians did is take all the money and build up their conventional capability in a way right. that in particular, if you're on the northern border of Israel, um, you have a big problem on your hands here. So there's a lot of talk about the, this conventional threat in the region has manifested an entirely different and threat, separate and apart from the nuclear issue, which somebody's gonna have to deal with it some, in some way, shape, or form. Now, with all of the tough rhetoric about the Iranians that the administration is talking about, there's also, Implicit in the same rhetoric is, we really don't want to be involved. We really don't want to be there in a fundamental way. And part of the policy until this moment has been, we're going to let the Saudis and everybody else figure out what they want to do. Well, so we're going to have proxy wars. I think the Saudi government for the moment is disabled. Um, and the umpire, I would say we've always been the umpire and the arbitrator of what happens, has left the building again. And the consequence of all that is, how does this play out? We have American forces, Russian presence. Uh, we had Russians attack Americans. Americans really take them on. We've had, we've had Israeli military action against the Syrians. We have a confluence of people, power, airplanes, two superpowers on the ground simultaneously 
with very little in the way of diplomatic effort going on to sort of sit down with everybody to figure out what the way station is to avert a wider regional war, which could happen. Now, what will the Iranian regime do? I think in the near term they wait and watch. Obviously, they're ascendant in the region, but their internal situation is really quite grave. So, scenario one, they concede at some point and say, after some amount of pressure, they say, we want to negotiate another deal. Likelihood, not high. What is our policy, Dennis? Is it to replace the regime, or is it to get a better deal? In the interim, there's going to be a lot of suffering on the part. And then we think about, when you think about Iranian society, there's the top side of the leadership and the three or 400,000 people who have guns mm -hmm. and will kill their people as they did in 2009. We have demonstrations. 2009 was sort of the urban intelligentsia, and the last set of demonstrations was in the heart of the regime's bread, bread basket. In Qom and Mashhad and other places, people are carrying signs saying, we don't care about Syria, we don't care about Gaza, we don't care about Yemen, we're suffering. Right. This is a very complicated situation. And I think this rhetoric is way beyond what we, what we think we're going to do, what we're going to deliver, what we need to talk to the Russians about, what we need to have the Israelis on our hip about. And I don't know that, I don't know there's a full knowledge of the danger the region has just entered. And final point, and I apologize, Mike, and then I'll shut up. You're on, you're on a roll. No. There's a really other significant point, and it goes to the issue of our allies and friends. The JCPOA was negotiated, was not a unilateral, was not a treaty between the United States. We have Europeans, uh, the Russians, the Chinese. We have all kinds of other players. We're in a trade war with the Chinese. We're dumping all over the Europeans. Your allies are not on your hip right. as you make a move. Xi Jinping's trying to figure out whether the trade war is going to become a cold war and what it means Will he decouple his relationship with the United States and take a harder line? Well, I think you better think about the Russians. You better think about the Chinese. You better think about the environment you're putting the Israelis in. And don't get over your skis and stimulate something that we're going to lose control of. So everything he said, all right? Uh, I was going to say, this sounds like it's another thing that keeps you up at night. Yeah. Only because I was talking to you tonight, Dennis. Yeah. You, you asked a question earlier about the uh, intelligence policy interface, yep. right? And yep. truth and objective reality was my point. It, it, it's more complicated than that. It, it's just not being right. It's just, just not being fact-based. It's what's the story, mm -hmm. all right? And so I could go in there to the current president, and I could take facts and use facts, or I, some of this was with the former president, because it changes over time. But I could use facts to say, what you got here, Mr. President? What you got here is autocrats versus Democrats. And I can lay out that story. And Dennis, it would be, all be true. And it would suggest a certain course of action. And then I could go in there and say, you know what you got here, Mr. President? You got a humanitarian crisis. I mean, half this country doesn't live where it used to live. All right? That's how many have been displaced. And that suggests a certain course. And I could say that, you know what you got here, Mr. President? you got a sectarian conflict. And we know about sectarian conflicts. And that's going to push you into a different course of action. And then you could say, Mr. President, what you got here? What you got here is a base for terrorism, global terrorism. And that's going to push you to make those kinds of decisions. And then you could go in there and say, you know what this is? This is that Sunni Shia thing. This goes back to 623 and, 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 the, and, and the successor to the prophet. And it has to do with the Sunni-Shia split. And that suggests a certain course of action. And then finally, you could say, you know, I wouldn't have predicted this, Mr. President, but we've got an east-west thing here with the Russians going on for the first time in 50 years. And it would push, push exactly. you to another course of action. Exactly. We have to decide right. what the main plot line is right. when we go brief the president. Every one of those has been at one time or another the dominant plot line. And there could be arguments today as to which is the dominant plot line. Right? And so more than just lining up the facts, right. we have to tell the story. We have to tell the story. For example, 
there is a real big dispute in the analytic community about the relationships of the, of the Russians and the Iranians. And the Israelis are intimately involved in this because my Israeli friends will say, we have a great relationship with the Russians. They understand us, and they, they understand us, we understand them, and we got this under control. The flip side about it is, my personal, my personal analytic view is, the Russians are in bed with the Iranians, or are in bed with the Syrians, and the Russians have established a footfall, and they are never going to let their regional partner, the Iranians, suffer because it's undermining American influence in a fundamental way. Now, big analytical debate. Who's right, who's wrong? Yeah. Well, sooner or later, you've got to go talk to the Russians, uh, because if you don't, yeah. you're guessing. But I, let me come back to the point you suggested by the way you shaped your question, all right? We ripped up the JCPOA, and at the same time, the president wants to withdraw American forces from Syria, even in the face of state and defense opposition. In, in essence, we've chosen to hit the Iranians with our carrots and to pull away our sticks. Not a great formula. <laughs> no, no, and, and, and we all know what's going on between Tehran and Damascus. Through southern Iraq, there's now a superhighway that's resupplying all of, Ar all of Iran's activities. I mean, this is not rocket science. No, that's why I asked about countering malign activities. The it's very, it's hard. No, because we, we've chosen not to. We, we've chosen to go over here, rip up the JCPOA, alienate our allies in the hope that we can popper the Iranians enough that they'll decide not to do this other stuff. We could actually spend the whole evening here. George and I often do, but that's, that's different. Uh, <laughs> and there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a few other questions I could ask. I want to close with one. And there, I, I, I raise it with a sense of irony. The two of you, uh, in your policy, in your intelligence responsibilities, in your careers, were extremely private people. Uh, and you became, not necessarily because you wanted it, you became public people. Was that something that, uh, from your standpoint, you thought was avoidable? Was it something that is not avoidable? Is it something that, as you talk to your successors, you have some advice to give them? So, in, in my case, it, it starts with defending the community George and I represent, all right? Uh, intelligence, I don't think there's another activity that we as a society undertake that is as essential to American democracy, not just security, but American democracy as intelligence that is less understood by the broader population than American espionage is. And so I, I felt a certain responsibility because folks in government could not, all right? And I, I mean, you know, there, there's no one who was in government at the time of some controversies early in the Obama administration or post Snowden. There was no one in government who called me up and say, you know, we'd like you to be quiet. It was quite the opposite, all right? Because they knew they couldn't speak. And then I found myself in this public place as the primary campaign began in 2016. And, and, and there, you know, and I, so I, it's important to remember, I wasn't in that place because of the primary campaign. I was in that place when the primary campaign began. And, and I was just simply asked questions about some of the points of view that were being put out there. And I, I just gave what I thought were objective, fact-based answers. And no, I don't think that's a pretty good idea. Let me show you, let me tell you why. And that's just gathered its own momentum. Dennis, I had a panel at an institute I, I run down at George Mason about two months ago. It's Jim Clapper, myself, uh, uh, Mike Rogers from NSA, and then Phil Mudd, yeah. all right? Yep. And, and Nicole Wallace from MSNBC was, was the moderator. And, and fundamentally, the question she asked us is, why are you guys on TV? Because that is really non-traditional. Yeah. And, and the answer I gave, I think to broad acceptance, was in an emergency, break glass. 
So I sort of have a different view, but it's, it's all personal. It's not that you don't care deeply. I mean, I, actually, you did get, we did become very public people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, these were tough jobs for a long time, and my conscious decision is to become a private person, to care about issues, talk to my colleagues. The deep state does talk to each other from time <laughs> to time. I mean, you know, it's, 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 there is no deep state. But for me and my family, and, uh, you know, I, I, my preference is uh, drift back into the shadows and root for the home team and take care of the people. And I admire Mike and everybody else who does it. It's just a personal choice to be, to be different and just that enough is enough and it's good for me. You know, I want to... I want to thank you on behalf of everybody. Can I, can I say one more thing you before say you get off? Two more things, but it's no, yeah. just one more thing. Um, I just want to. I know you all know this, but I had between about 1996 and 2001 the real privilege of working with Dennis, and I've never met somebody who is more committed to the Middle East peace process than Dennis Ross. I've never seen anybody work harder. I've never seen anybody be more creative and try to bring hope out of a tragedy, and in the end, we didn't get there. But Dennis Ross deserves an enormous amount of thanks from the American people, from Palestinians and Israelis, from people who want peace-loving people to come together and end conflict. He made a material difference, and I want to say thank you. This was actually supposed to be about us thanking them, not me being thanked. I should note, and George reminded me, uh, George knows I went to UCLA. He knows I'm a big basketball fan. And he called me uh, when I was in Ramallah, and he was in Pauley Pavilion. <laughs> and he reminded me it's the only time I ever hung up on him. But uh, I want to say on behalf of everybody here, um, how honored we are to be able to honor the, the two of you. Uh, the, the, I said it at the outset, what you have done for the country uh, will never be fully appreciated, uh, but this is a token of our appreciation for what you have done, and honestly, what you continue to do. And, and Mike, you're doing it uh, because you understand exactly what's at stake right now, and even though George says he's a private person all of that, I happen to know how many people still talk to George, and for all the obvious and important reasons. So thank you very much on behalf of everybody here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That was great.